Good morning and welcome to Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile House, BC, Canada. It's Sunday, January the 17th, 2021. Welcome to all our friends and uh, people that come to our assembly. Glad that we could meet online. For those of you who are uh, new, who've never watched our broadcast before, my name is Pastor Clint Lang. We'd just like to welcome you to our Sunday morning service. Well, we're going to be continuing in my sermon series in the book of James. So would you bow with me in prayer before we start this morning? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to come before you and to hear from your word. God, I pray for each person that's out there. You know exactly what needs to happen in the hearts and lives of every individual. So God, I pray that you would just speak through me and that my words would be true to your, uh, to your word, O oh God, and that uh, you would encourage where encouragement is needed, strengthen where strength is needed, and uh, Lord, teach where teaching is needed. And I praise you and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning, uh, I'd like to talk to you about strength that we need in times of persecution. So when life hits us with full force, it's normal for us to stammer under its impact. Hardship comes in many forms and, and suffering is common to all people. It's easy to lose a healthy perspective in living uh, when we're undergoing suffering. Over the past couple of weeks, uh, Peter has, has been speaking through this book to the ancient churches of Asia Minor about having God's understanding concerning the aspect of suffering. And I, I've spoken to this on general terms. But this week I would like to finish addressing the subject and would like to move into discussing a different aspect of suffering. Now, Peter continues his teaching to the letters of these uh, Christians in Asia Minor, ancient Turkey. And uh, in proper context, he moves into speaking to the church about persecution, which is a very specific kind of suffering. Peter talks about legitimate persecution and he differentiates it between suffering because our behavior is bad. And I've, I've contemplated this and, and many people say that in this country we, we do not know what persecution is because in Canada we have freedom to think, believe, and voice our opinions without significant backlash. And, and I have to say, yes, you know, we have a very difficult time understanding what other people in different countries in the world are facing, even now, um, in this generation. But while we have the freedom to do all these things in many aspects, um, in recent years we've seen maybe a, a deterioration in some of our freedoms due to the stranglehold that humanism has uh, secured in our educational institutions and the, s the status quo of our, of our society has changed and um, you know, it's becoming increasingly evident that there is resistance and hostility to the ideologies and, and doctrines of historical Christianity and also to the born-again Christians uh, who embrace them. So this being said, I, I, I believe Peter would have the Christians embrace a proper perspective to both legitimate persecution and uh, also if they have to reform their behavior, if they're acting in such a way where they bring disdain upon their own heads because they're embracing ungodly, biblically unsupported behaviors. So my text this morning is found in the book of 1 Peter chapter 4 uh, from verses 12 to 19. So let's start this morning by, by reading the first two verses of our text, uh, verses 12 to 14. Peter writes this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. So after reading this portion of scripture, um, the first thing I'd like to speak to you about is the fact that suffering, persecution, can be within God's will. Now we've all heard about our brothers and sisters overseas living under these oppressive regimes, being imprisoned, beaten, and killed for holding their testimony in Christ. Over the past 10 years, as a matter of fact, I, I've done some research on this. 
of the Center for the Study of Global Christianity, they, they report that worldwide, in the past 10 years, over 900,000 Christians have been executed for holding to their faith in Jesus Christ. Mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, and children. Shot, burned, drowned, beheaded for refusing to deny their Lord. And this is in our lifetime, my friends. Well, to put that in perspective, it's kind of like a city the size of Edmonton, uh, Alberta, being wiped out. In 10 years, that many Christians globally have died for their faith in Christ. Hmm. Gives you some perspective when we start to think about persecution that we face. Maybe some persecution that we think is coming on us because we're locked down and our government's not allowing us to meet at this time because of this pandemic that's sweeping the country. Now, that gives you some thought to consider. I, I, I don't deny that persecution is a reality, but here in Canada, sometimes we need, I think, a reality check when it comes to understanding the level of legitimate persecution against Christians here in this country compared with what we see on a global level. But since we live in this wonderful free country of ours, let's bring this down to a level that we can relate with. You know, sometimes because of our status in Canada, we've come to believe a lie. That we should be able to speak and live truly Christian lives without any hardship or suffering at all. And that this is our God-given right. As a result, um, when suffering of persecution hits us, even in a minor way, many believers are taken off guard because in our nation... Uh, because we've had it so good, I, I think a lot of us have an immature view of the idea of suffering and a sense of entitlement almost, as though somehow we should be above it. Now, instead of giving thanks to God when legitimate persecution happens, as Christians do in countries like Iran, Indonesia, or China, we're tempted to default to having this artificial sense of entitlement, embracing the polar opposite uh, attitude of Christ towards persecution and suffering. Instead of becoming incised and aggravated at the moral wrongness of what has just happened to us in our spirit and letting God take care of the result and the outcomes, we get it we get upset and begin to take matters into our own hands. Now, I think this is really because we have an immature view of suffering, because we've been babied. Now, here in 1 Peter chapter 4, the Apostle Peter says to the believers that they should not be surprised at the fiery ordeal they were encountering, as though something strange were happening to them. Have you ever felt strange? when you get persecuted for your faith, that it's strange that this is happening. We shouldn't have this happening in Canada. This shouldn't be happening in the United States. We're a free country. We should, we should have freedom. Surprise. Jesus goes even further than this. See, Not only should we uh, not be surprised when we're persecuted, but I think we should expect it. Because Jesus says in Luke 6, 22 and 23, he says, Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. So whether we live in a country like Canada, the United States, or a country like North Korea, China, or Nigeria, when we're persecuted, we must be always, always aware of the deception of our own human nature, which wants to take matters into our own hands, rather than counting ourselves blessed by God and letting Him deal with it. When we allow our flesh to dictate our actions and our anger 
gets a hold of us, it leads to lashing out. And when we do, we do much in the way of damaging our Christian witness collectively and individually. And that's funny how those who are severely persecuted often have a very different, more scripturally mature uh, attitude towards their legitimate persecution than some of us Western Christians who we respond to minor paper cut persecution as if we are being cast alive into a burning inferno or facing a beheading or being cast into a den of lions. Some of us do not respond to persecution well. Some of us need to take some stock in how we react when we get resistance from the world. We let the fear of man take root and our witness as a result becomes impotent. Not only sometimes do we get angry and lash out, but sometimes even mild persecution makes us back off because we don't like the feeling of being isolated. We don't like the feeling of being marginalized. So it's easier just not to say anything than to speak up. My friends, I'd like to talk to you about the witness of an Iraqi Christian man named Amer. And Amer told his story to Samaritan's Purse. And Samaritan's Purse reports that uh, this man named Amer uh, had suffered intense persecution. And, and they wanted to tell the story because of Amer's attitude towards what he's had to face. I'm going to read some of this for you. It would be easy for Amer to be bitter. Militants from the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, ISIS, forced the 53-year-old man to flee from his home in Mosul, where his family had lived for generations. He now lives in a cold, drafty United Nations camp for internally displaced peoples in northern Iraq. Instead of being bitter, he radiates joy despite the deplorable conditions. I am not sad, Amer said. I am happy because Jesus told us in the New Testament to leave everything and come to him and he will help us. You see, when ISIS arrived in Amer's hometown, the terrorists were cordial at first until the Muslim leaders announced during noon prayers one Friday that everyone was to tell their Christian neighbors that they must leave the city within 24 hours. Amer received the news from friends who lived next to his family for almost 40 years. Seeing an ISIS fighter on the street, Amer asked, Who are you? What do you want from us? The man challenged Amer to become a Muslim so he would not have to leave his home, his business, and his car behind. You win my car, Amer said. I have a company for cutting stones and marble. You win it as well. But you will also lose because I love my Jesus. He went on to tell this man that Jesus taught his followers not to store up treasures on earth, but to store up treasures in heaven, according to Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Therefore I am not sad, Amer said. You are the loser. I am happy. I forgive you. What did you say? asked the ISIS fighter. Yes, I forgive you because our Jesus told us to forgive our enemies. He told us in the New Testament to love our enemies. I love you. I forgive you. Take everything. I will die for my Jesus. Angry, the ISIS fighter demanded that Amer leave. He said, If I see you Saturday at noon, I will take your head. Okay, I'll leave, Amer said. Congratulations on my house. Congratulations on my company. Aware that ISIS was robbing Christians of all their money as they went through their checkpoint, Amer's neighbors helped him escape. They drove him to the checkpoint, one dressed in his white clothes and hat as though he was heading to the mosque for prayers. Seeing Amer in the back seat, the guard said, How are you, Mr. Haji? Thinking he was a Muslim, 
the terrorists let Amer through without incident. Leaving his neighbor, Amer continued on to the Kurdish army checkpoint. Safely on the other side of it, he prayed fervently, Thank you, God. I will follow you forever. Amer made his way to Erbil, where more than 200,000 displaced people have settled. He moved from house to house until he settled in the refugee camp in the unfinished mall. Amer puts his suffering into perspective by comparing it to the cross. This is the Christian religion, he said. Not houses, good cars, or money. When we feel hungry, tired, or cold, living in this room like a refrigerator, our Jesus felt like this. Wow, what a testimony. As North American Christians, we we would do very well to pay attention to the attitude displayed by persecuted believers like Amer. But further to this, Jesus tells us in Luke 6, 27 and 28, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. The question is this, do we respond to persecution against us the same way Jesus instructs us here? The same way that Amer faced his persecution? Or do we respond to persecution even if it is like a minor paper cut in comparison to people like Amer with a sense of entitlement? Most of us have endured suffering in some form for being a true Christian. This is true likely more than once, at work, at school, or in community activities. It happens. The Apostle Peter reinforces what I've said in verse 14 of our text when he states, If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Now Peter turns his attention from encouraging the saints to persevere under the legitimate persecution they face, to warning them about suffering in a way that was not pleasing to God, warning them not to bring suffering on their own heads by making bad decisions and, ex- and embracing outlaw behavior. You see, not only can we suffer persecution because God allows it and that we're blessed by Him in it, Blessed are you when men shall revile you. But we can suffer unnecessary persecution from bad decisions that we make and outlaw behavior. Peter continues reading, or writing, I should say, in verse 15 of our text saying, If you suffer, it should not be a murder as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even a meddler. Meddler is someone who's involving himself in business that's not his to be involved in. There are times when as Christian people we can make some very poor decisions. Now, every one of us struggles at times with our sinful nature. In the original churches, um, the history books tell us that uh, some of these Christians came from very desperate circumstances. Many of them have had been criminals at one point. They had been bound to a life of crime. They heard the gospel and came to accept grace and forgiveness from the Lord in their lives. And that they were set free, but there is still a temptation for them to return to their former behaviors and to use the grace of God as a license for bad behavior. Ellicott's Bible commentary suggests that in the time when Christians were being persecuted by, legitimately, by Roman Imperial uh, Diocletian um, and Sirius, the bishop of Carthage, found it necessary to expose those who drew persecution upon themselves to cloak their crimes under the pretense of the Christian faith and living in freedom to do what they want because of God's grace. The same as true of believers today. We must not use our freedom in Christ to pursue behaviors that are rooted in selfish inclinations that come from our sin nature. We must remember that the evil one desires that we be viewed by the world around us as evildoers and as such in an attempt 
to discredit our witness tempts us to play God, digging in where we ought to be letting go, fighting when we ought to be praying, uh, hiding when we ought to be loving and caring, and protesting and fuming when we ought to be blessing. Many Christians who think that they're being persecuted for being a Christian, when it comes down to it, in fact, they're not being persecuted for being a genuine follower of Christ, but are being persecuted by bad behavior that they're doing. Some believers are apt to act inappropriately in their financial dealings. Maybe Christians have failed to pay their rent or their bills on time. Or maybe Christians are excessively grumpy towards other people. Sometimes Christians fail to keep their word on something they promised someone else. When they speak, sometimes the world sees some Christians living a different way than they say they believe. Some believers act selfishly regarding having their own needs met at the expense of the safety and well-being of the other people around them. Some believers fail to keep a tight rein on their tongues and become gossipers and meddlers in other people's business when it is no business of theirs, blackening people's reputation behind their back, casting judgments, being unaware of the totality of the circumstances of their stabbed brethren. When others do not believe, others who do not believe, when they hear these kind of things or see these kind of actions coming from Christians, they don't appreciate our lifestyle. They look at us as as bad company and they reject us along with the message of life that we carry. Oh, my friends, this is a grievous sin. When we are conducting ourselves polar opposite to the attitude and example set by Christ and His apostles, as outlined through the doctrines of Scripture in proper context, should we be surprised that we are persecuted for unrighteousness' sake? In this case, we are not blessed by God and are grieving the Holy Spirit. If we are displaying rebellious, outlaw behaviors, we must be careful not to attribute the negative reaction and rejection that people in the world give us in response as being a result of Satan's oppression on us. This is everything to do with Satan's oppression but it is not in the same way that some of these people are thinking. The oppression is that they're believing a lie. I recently read a post by a believing man named Jesse Jost in which he correctly surmised that God has given us a sphere of responsibility with actions that he is calling us to take. But there is also a sphere or or jurisdiction that is way bigger than us. Things that are beyond our control. These things are God's responsibilities. And according to Jesse, one of Satan's favorite ways to sabotage believers is to get them to confuse these two spheres, ignoring what is right in front of us and the things that God is calling us to do in the here and now, and instead putting our focus on and obsessing on the things that are way out of our control. You see, when we try to control things that are out of our control and are God's responsibilities, we end up making a royal mess. Is the persecution we face legitimate persecution? Or is it originating because we're acting acting inappropriately, foolishly, or selfishly? Is our behavior outlaw behavior? We have to look at this. Nobody should be looking at anyone else. I need to ask myself this. 
Is my heart aligned with the Holy Spirit and how He views things? Am I trusting in God to take care of the things that are His responsibilities? This is an important question to ask. If our behavior as believers looks more like criminal behavior rather than Christ-like behavior, we stand on dangerous ground and we need to ask God to forgive us and repent. As believers, we're called to carry ourselves in a way that is glorifying to Jesus, representing His gospel to our community with exemplary behavior, displaying faith, love, and purity in step with the Holy Spirit. Today, if we are failing in this area, there is forgiveness. The good news is that we can cut free from the sin that so easily entangles our feet. 1 John 1 verse 9 very clearly tells us that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and He is just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You see, friends, we don't have to accept the enemy's lie which wants us to refuse sound teaching from God's Word taught in its proper context. And we don't have to say, well, that's just the way I am. I guess they'll have to put up with my personality and accept my faults. And if they don't, too bad, so sad. My friends, such people who embrace this attitude, they suffer a lot of pain and grief in what they would consider as persecution, but not for the sake of Jesus and the gospel that he promotes. Brothers and sisters, this is not the attitude that Christ and God that, that Christ and the Father God call us to. So that being clearly stated, Peter continues to speak to the believers in verses sixteen to eighteen, suggesting that there is great honor in suffering for bearing the name of Jesus, in standing up for righteousness. Strength and victory won through suffering is a blessing of persecution. Peter tells them, However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Now our natural reaction to persecution when it comes at us, right, is to fight against it or to shrink back in shame. But there's no shame in suffering. That's unless we're suffering because of outlaw behavior. But to suffer for Christ in the proper uh, context where we're obeying the Lord's word is actually a great honor. We don't glorify God for suffering, but we do glorify Him in suffering and we glorify Him for what He will accomplish in us and through us with the suffering that He is permitting us to have. Peter encourages the saints saying, don't be ashamed, but give praise unto the Lord that we bear Jesus' name. I, I agree with Bible commentary, uh, commentator David Guzik who says, in the context of suffering, he says, Peter tells us that the judgment begins in the house of God. God uses suffering as judgment in a positive purifying sense. For Christians, the house of God now. In this sense, you see, the Lord is telling us to treat hardship as discipline. Remember the scripture in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, 7 to 11, tells us this. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? And if you are not disciplined, 
and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, in order that we might share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Persecution, persecution for righteousness' sake can really reform us and help us and can set the stage for uh, future things that God wants to do in and through us. We look at the example of Joseph in the Old Testament, right? In the book of Genesis, Joseph was persecuted As a child, he was thrown down a well, exported to a foreign land, sold into slavery, falsely accused of rape, and and he was forgotten in prison for a long time. All of this is 17 years in length, and where is God in all this? That's the question, right? Why is God letting this happen? You see, God God puts the, the story of Joseph in his scriptures to show us how he can use the specific details of our suffering, both for our benefit and and also to redeem his people. The administrative gifts and cultural awareness Joseph develops while imprisoned become vital to God using him to feed the Hebrew people during a, a famine that occurred. So consider Joseph's reunification in the end with his family, right? In the end, Joseph tells his brothers who'd sold him into slavery. In Genesis 50, 20, he says, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done to save many lives. <laughs> Consider what would have happened if Joseph did not go through what he went through. You see, we need to take this example to heart and treat our persecution and suffering in the same way. We may feel that our time of Persecution at our jobs, at our school, wherever we are, serves no purpose. And and we want to fight against the injustices that come against us. Or maybe we just want to hide our head in the sand and make it all go away. But if we focus on the bigger picture and trust in God and thank Him and realize that we're blessed, we'll see that our, our suffering may be disciplinary. It may save us from God's second best plan, Uh, or the destruction that we may reap in the future if we are left to our own devices. God's discipline, when it comes to his children, is not meant to be destructive. It's meant to be corrective and purifying and growing. It takes off the rough edges on our lives and creates mature outlooks for the people who endure. And uh, it draws us closer to him. Therefore, in conclusion today, We can rejoice and not look at fiery trials and persecution as negative, but as something to be thankful for. Having come to this conclusion, we're freed in our spirits to react to the things that take place around us in the same way as our Iraqi brother, Amer. And we can choose to continue to do good when the world as we know it is collapsing around us. God is faithful and true to his word. He says that he will be with us through anything that we go through and that he will never leave us or forsake us. He'll be with us to the very end of the age. He will strengthen us when we are weak and he will bring us into his eternal glory when this trial of our lives is over. Isn't that wonderful news? So my friends, if you're struggling with um, feeling like you need to do something about the injustice of the world that you see around you that seems to be coming against Christians in the church. I would counsel you, do what God has called you to do and don't concern yourselves with the things that are his responsibility. God will take care of his his bigger picture. He's calling you to live the same way that Jesus lived. And if you do this, you will be blessed, even if you are persecuted and you have to suffer. And I pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen. God bless you today. God, I pray for all the people that are out there this morning that you would bless them, that you would strengthen them, that they would understand the love that you have for them. And I praise you and I thank you that we've had this time together. And I pray that you would be glorified throughout this week in your church. In Jesus' name, amen.